uh, 516, so we have a full, everyone on the Port Authority is here, so I will call the Port Authority to order. And Cheryl, do you want to call your HR8 uh, order? Yes, um, I will call to order the July 11th, um, 2023 meeting of the Housing and Redevelopment Authority meeting, and let it be noted, a quorum is present. So the first item on the agenda for the Port Authority is the approval of the agenda, and does anybody have any things that they want to add? Otherwise, I think we can just go on. We don't, don't typically approve the agenda unless anybody has any objection. So Cheryl, you want to? Okay, we'll, your... we'll do it the same way. Um, are there any additions or changes you'd like to make to the agenda? Hearing none, uh, the agenda is approved. Thank you, and I just want to say, before we get into the business, that I'm delighted that we're having this joint session. It's something that we've talked about doing for, for many years, and I think that there has been overlap and will continue to be in, in just looking at what the two boards are doing, so I think it's a, a great thing. I don't know whether it's appropriate, since a lot of us haven't seen each other. We could, we've, we've got name tags, but the name tags are kind of hard to see, so maybe we just want to go around and, and start. Rob, I'll put you on the spot. You're, say your name and how... How long you've been involved with the Port Authority? And uh, I'm Rob Lawrence. You have to turn your mic on. <laughs> I've been in Blue since 1971, and I think I've been on the Port for about eight years right now. Uh, prior to that, I was in the City's Board of Assessment Review and certain other things. So I've been around a little while. So Great. I live up near the ski jump. Cynthia? Hi, Cynthia. Put, you to put, your put your. Here, I turned yours on and not mine. <laughs> <laughs> Cynthia Hunt, um, I've been on the Port Authority for 10, 10 years? I think it's longer. But I, I think so, too, 10, 12 <laughs> years. Anyway, and I also serve on the, the Charter Commission, and then prior to that, I was on the, um, years ago, I was on the um, um, Planning Commission. So. Great. Tim? It's a long-time listener, first-time caller kind of thing. Um, so, Tim Keller, I've been here since 1987, and I've been on the port for, I'm thinking, 15, 16, 17, 18, old enough to vote, years. <laughs> Two mayors and several you know, managers. Um, and um, what else can I say? Nothing would be your preference. It's mine. <laughs> Steve? Uh, Steve Peterson. Uh, I think I joined the port in 2012. It's probably roughly the time frame that I joined under the previous mayor. Um, I live just basically straight south of here in Bloomington. I'm also, like Cynthia, on the Charter Commission, and also, like Cynthia, was on the Planning Commission at one point, and I was also a city council member, who's how I originally got involved in this body. Mr. Mayor. Hello, HRA. Great to see you tonight. Thanks for being here. I'm glad we're able to do this. I really am. This is, uh, I think, going to be very helpful in a lot of ways, if for no other reason than uh, an opportunity just to open up uh, more lines of communication between any number of folks with any number of folks. So great to see you. I, my name is Tim. Uh, I'm, I've been on the Port Authority for 11 years. I've also got a couple of other roles in the city. That, uh, <laughs> I'm Bob Erickson. Uh, I've been on the Port Authority since its inception in, what, 1980 or something? Maybe before that. Uh, at any rate, um, we live in Bloomington, uh, have lived in here, house we built 43 years ago. Jenna? Uh, Jenna Carter, so I'm in my fourth year on City Council, fourth year on the Port, and then first year on the HRA. Um, Cheryl Lewis, and this is my second term on the HRA. Prior to that, uh, some time ago, I was also on the Planning Commission, and I've been in Bloomington over 40 years, so I must have been 12. <laughs> well, we're about the same then. <laughs> so are we 12? 12, yeah. <laughs> Slightly older now. Okay. Uh, my name is Rod Wooten. This is my first year on the HRA board. Hi, I'm Jennifer Mueller, and this is my first year on the HRA board. I've lived in Bloomington just a little over 20 years, over by Washburn Elementary. 
Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Patrick Martin. I've been on the Bloomington Council for about five and a half years now, uh, and first year on the HRA. Uh, Blake Doblinger. I've been on the council. It's my first year. I've lived in Bloomington since 2018, and first job in government. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well that's that's great. I guess we all know our, our, our leaders, Risha and uh, Holly. And uh, so, the first item that the Port Authority has on the, on, I'm sorry, Erica. Erica. Okay. Well, I. I <laughs> sorry, Erica. Um, the first item on the Port Authority agenda is the approval of minutes for our. May 30th, 2023. So I would entertain a motion for the approval of the those minutes. So moved. Second. We have a motion made and seconded. Did you get the people making the motion and second? Great. Any additions or corrections? If not, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Minutes are approved unanimously. Uh, we then have some organizational business, uh, and I guess this is Port Authority too. So we, we item 4.1, designation of additional official depositories for the Port Authority. Lori, are you going to handle that? Or? Yes, Mr. President. So we are adding, um, normally we add uh, the depositories and have the, the boards and the city council approve those boards at uh, the beginning of the, each year. And um, as we're looking at some of our racial equity activities, we are adding two new banks. One is First um, Independence Bank, which is um, a black owned bank, and then the Woodland National Bank, which is um, an, um, owned by the Malax Band of Ojibwe. And they are um, being added or requesting their approval to be added so that we can include them in our um, certificates of depository program so um, as, as we move forward and, and if they're approved we would look at um, as, as funding is available to have um, certificates of deposit up to 250,000 so they stay under the um, FDIC insurance amount so that <laughs> we're fully covered if something should happen to that certificate of deposit so the request for motion is to approve those two banks so any questions or comments on that Okay. All right. Uh, I would then entertain a motion for the approval of adding these two banks to our list of Port Authority depositories. So moved. Motion, motion made by Commissioner Keller, second by Commissioner Bussey. And, and Commissioner Hunt has recused herself. Any additional questions or comments? If not, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Six with one abstention. Uh, the next item then we have is the external auditor's report, and I think this is joint for the HRA and the Port Authority. So, Mr. President and, and Madam President, um, as Andy Herring um, is approaching um, the presentation day is here, um, Andy is with Red Path and Company the city and um, members of the HRA and Port Authority um, built an R request for proposal and um, proposals were taken last fall. Um, we update our um, RFP process every five years and Red Path and Company was selected and um, by all of the boards and he is here to present year-end audit activities. Um, he works for um, the council and you um, and finance just assists in the process. Andy? All right. Thank you, everybody. And nice for me that it's a joint meeting as well. It means <laughs> a presentation. So as Lori mentioned, I'm here to present the results of the 2022 audit. Um, I was at a city council meeting recently, went over the results of the city audit. But really all of the three audits, it's, it's done at once, um, which is obviously there's different sections, but the three audits are done at once, so that was our, our responsibility, my responsibility. And as part of the audit, there's five reports that are issued, the opinion on the financial statements. And the financial statements, they include the, the activities of the city, the port, and the HRA all combined into one. 
So and there's a report on internal controls, a report on state uh, legal compliance, a report on federal compliance, and then a communication letter with those charged with governance. Um, just a summary of the results. It's an, we issued an unmodified or a clean opinion on the financial statements. There was one internal control finding, which I'll cover in a minute here. No findings on Minnesota compliance, no findings on federal compliance, and standard communications to the governing bodies. Looking back at 2021, the city once again received and a certificate of achievements in certificate for excellence in financial reporting. It's a, it's a mouthful, the, the name of a, the award, but that's, that award was received once again that, like I mentioned, does include the financial statements of the port and the HRA, and it's an award to recognize that the financial statements were prepared in a transparent and consistent manner, and that's um, a manner across the, the the requirements of the GFOA, which cover all the all of the United States and Canada. I'm a quick overview of the audit process. We begin our planning back in December, perform preliminary testing in December, January timeframe, and then really turn it over to the city port HRA staff to prepare the audit work papers, prepare for the audit, close the books on 2022. Uh, we began our audit in April, um, towards the end of April, performed the majority of our testing at the end of April and May, and concluded in June and issued our reports on June 16th. So the audit, what did we do? Our responsibility is to verify the financial statements are prepared in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles uh, relating to government standards. How did we do it? We plan the audit to verify occurrence and completeness, ensuring that all things that should be in the financial statements are included in the financial statements, and also to make sure nothing that's in the financial statements, making sure it, it all pertains to the city, HRA, and port. Um, and then accuracy, cutoff classification, ensuring amounts are recorded in the correct year and in the correct accounts, things like that. Various audit techniques are used, um, such as simply tracing to invoices or grant agreements or other agreements, uh, analytical procedures, looking at trends, um, maybe comparing to budget, uh, th those sort of things. Um, also, we look at journal entries, which are specific transactions that are recorded um, to adjust or, um, or reclassify amounts. And, like I said, the result, an unmodified or a clean opinion was issued on the financial statements. Next, a report on internal controls over financial reporting. We gained an understanding of the internal controls in place, examples of internal controls, <coughs> approvals over disbursements, approvals over the bank reconciliation proc process. We look to see that there's an ideal segregation of duties ensuring that no one person has too much responsibility in any given area. And also on the back end that a review of the financial information is being performed to detect errors. And during our audit, we caught two more significant errors. One pertained to an assessment role on the city side, and one pertained to a loan receivable um, from a developer on the HRA side, the Aon note, uh, payments began, uh, collection of payments on the note started in 2021, and initially all of the, the note contained a principal and an interest portion, and initially all of the payments were coded to principal, meaning the loan balance was reduced quicker than it should have been, but that was corrected um, now, and that was, I should clarify, that's that was an adjustment on paper only. Uh, the, the actual billing out to the developer and the collection of the dollars, it was, it was the same regardless of how it was recorded on paper. So um, just an internal adjustment that was needed there um, to correct things. Um, staff are now aware of the issue. It was corrected during the audit 
and there should be no problems moving forward. Andy, Andy, just to, to give us an idea, I mean, how many different accounts and things is the city working with? Because I'm sure that you probably have thousands of these different accounts that you're dealing with. So if we have something with one or something, it's we don't like to have that happen. But Right. The, there are, you know, not thousands of these kinds of loans, but there's thousands of different transactions, and some are very complicated and um, especially some of these loans with the HRA there's oh there I, I think there's around <clears throat> um, a dozen of the larger developer ones if I recall correctly now there's a lot of the smaller um, housing loans but yeah it's, it is a lot to keep track of and um, for the larger ones we did look at all of them and so this was the only one we detected a, an okay. error on um, and then we sample on the smaller loans. Is this something that in other audits that you do of, of other cities and that, that is, is something you, you run into frequently? Occasionally. Um, usually, you know, there's not, of the other audits, there's not these extensive loan programs like um, the Bloomington HRA has. Um, but occasionally, yeah, the, this financial statement corrections finding uh, meaning that we detected a, an error and that it was corrected. That's the most common finding we issue as part of an audit. Um, so, yeah, it's it's fairly common that we find something um, during an audit. Um, uh, it's not as common that we find that a loan was, you know, the, the principal and interest split was not mm -hmm. being recorded correctly just because there's not that many of those loans out there. Um, most of the smaller cities and HRAs aren't involved in, in those types of activities. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. That's helpful. Good. On the compliance side for, the, for state statutes, the state auditor issues a guide that we complete as part of the audit. The guide um, contains seven sections, as uh, you can see listed there. Few examples of what we're looking for to uh, ensure that proper collateral is maintained on any deposits in excess of FDIC insurance. Um, another one that's both applicable to both the HRA and the Port Authority is uh, provisions, uh, statutes relating to tax increment. So we're testing that as well. The results, no compliance findings. A federal compliance audit, also known as a single audit, was performed as well. Um, that's an audit that's required when expenditures of federal funds exceed $750,000. Uh, two major programs were audited as part of the single audit. The Section 8 Housing Choice Vouchers Program, which is part of the HRA, and then the American Rescue Plan Act dollars, um, which is... Um, obviously the COVID-related dollars that were received. Um, so we gain an understanding of the compliance requirements, test to ensure that those federal funds are being spent appropriately in accordance with the grant programs, and the results, no findings. Um, the last report that we issue, uh, it's really a, more of a letter of required communications from the auditor to the boards it notes there, there there was one new significant accounting standard that was adopted during the year. It related to leases, and it's applicable. It was applicable to the city on on their side. Uh, they have several antenna leases um, to the, for various um, cell tower antenna leases. There, there weren't any leases for the HRA or port that were applicable there. Um, there are estimates in the financial statements, but again, those were more on the city side. Um, overall, everything went smoothly for the audit. Um, no difficulties encountered or disagreements. Um, you know, was, of course, uh, a responsible leadership, but then you know, staff work hard, very hard as well. Uh, Jam, Jan Almquist on the port side, Mary Lee on the HRA side, um, both both are very easy to work with and provided us the information we needed during the audits. Um, 
a section on corrected and uncorrected misstatements in that letter. There was nothing significant that went uncorrected. Um, and then there was the two more significant items which I previously discussed. <clears throat> Lastly, just two slides to summarize the financial information of each entity. Um, for the port, um, just uh, the revenues and expenditures there of the year, the, the fund balance increased about 1.1 million. Um, and I'll, I'll just point out there that, you know, you've got the general fund balance of 73,000, uh, relatively small, but the, the fund balance of the debt service fund is restricted for debt service. And that fund balance of the capital project fund, which it, it's actually several funds, um, but the capital project fund is restricted for uh, TIF or tax increment related activities. And on the HRA side, I know it's a, it's a busy slide there with lots of numbers, but really the point is to show that uh, revenues exceeded expenditures by about $3 million during 2021, uh, leaving an ending fund balance of $18.8 million. But again, most of those funds are either restricted or committed for certain purposes, uh, such as tax increment or housing development. So with that, the next step would be for each board to uh, adopt a motion to accept the audit, but I'd be happy to answer any questions um, anybody has. So, so any Port Authority questions? Yeah. Any questions from the HRA? Well, if there's no questions, I would entertain a motion then for the Port Authority to accept the annual comprehensive financial report. It's on page seven is the wordage. Commissioner Hunt moves. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Carter. Any additional discussion? If not, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Um, I would be looking for a motion from the HRA to accept the, the HRA's annual comprehensive financial report for calendar year 2022. So, moved. To, second. It has been moved by Commissioner Wilton with a second by Commissioner Martin. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries six to zero. All right. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening, everybody. Welcome, Mr. City Manager. Thank you, Mr. President. First test, can I put that into the prop? There you go. <laughs> All right. Are these, these are already on, right? Okay. Good evening, everybody. Uh, for the commissioners I haven't met yet, it's a pleasure to meet you. Uh, thank you for your service to the community. Appreciate you uh, committing yourself to helping build the community. And uh, what I'm here to talk about, uh, Madam Chair and Mr. President, is uh, the Bloomington Forward, which is our um, program for reinvesting in community facilities. Uh, so I'm gonna breeze through. This is a new PowerPoint, so it's my first time presenting with the new PowerPoint, so it might be a little bit clunky here. I am going to be giving the same uh, presentation to all of the advisory boards and commissions over the course of the next couple months. Uh, so any feedback that you have will be helpful for me as I move forward in that. So uh, the council is um, uh, looking at how we uh, reinvest in amenities and facilities and natural resources throughout our community. Uh, some of this is based on the uh, growth and evolution of Bloomington as a community, uh, trying to identify those things that bring our community together and enhance quality of life. Uh, we've also spent a lot of time over the last several years understanding the wants and needs of residents and visitors in our community uh, and how facilities play an important role uh, in those wants and needs. And then uh, based on that information, we've put together a reinvestment plan uh, totaling $159 million that we have dubbed Bloomington Forward uh, to build a new health and wellness center 
to renovate uh, the Bloomington Ice Garden and to uh, provide new amenities and do critical uh, restoration of uh, natural habitat in the Nine Mile Creek Corridor. So the new plan to invest in Bloomington is uh, to uh, uh, move forward a couple of uh, top priorities. Uh, in order to do this, we had to go to the state legislature and get authority, uh, which was uh, given during this last legislative session. And that was to uh, authorize the city to move forward with the ballot referendum uh, to get voter approval uh, for a local option sales tax. Uh, that would create the revenue uh, to finance these projects. Uh, the state of Minnesota also provided $4 million in bonding money that we will use for pre-planning uh, of the Bloomington Ice Garden and for the Community Health and Wellness Center. Uh, the, the bonding money was actually $2.27 million for the uh, Ice Garden and $1.8 million for public health. And so we'll start the work of uh, planning around the facilities uh, and <clears throat> likely uh, we'll proceed with that work whether the referendum fails or not because these are, uh, these are uh, pieces of uh, facilities and amenities in the city that we know that we need investments in one way or the other. And then on November 7th, Bloomington voters will consider that half percent local option sales tax to finance the plan. So why now? Uh, talked about the growth and evolution of the community. Uh, the population increased uh, pretty significantly over the last 10-year period. And as of uh, just last week when we received an updated uh, number from the Metropolitan Council, the Bloomington population is now at 91,000 people. Wow. Uh, at more than uh, 60 years old, the Creekside Building and the Public Health Building have uh, essentially uh, outlived their usefulness. They're approaching functional obsolescence, and um, that's both in how they are able to deliver services and just in the uh, facilities themselves. Uh, Bloomington Ice Garden needs uh, significant um, reinvestment for roof repairs, uh, ice rink renovation, modernization of uh, most of the mechanical systems, not just the refrigeration. And then for um, Nine Mile Creek, I mentioned before the critical habitat restoration and uh, new trails and amenities. So at Creekside Community Center <clears throat> and the Public Health Center, as I said, both of those buildings are over 60 years old. Creekside, if you didn't know, was originally an elementary school right. and was only open for about 14 years. That was during the height of the population bloom in, uh, boom in Bloomington uh, back in the 50s and the 60s. Uh, and when they closed the school, they conveyed it to the city and it has functioned as a community center slash senior center uh, since then. Uh, as you can see there, there's a whole lengthy list of improvements that are needed, uh, most of them having to do with mechanical systems, uh, ADA compliance, um, and just the space that is available for uh, providing uh, services. The costs um, are, are more than what the value of the building are if we're just going to try to repair the buildings. And so the uh, reinvestment in this case is replacement to those facilities. And then, uh, like I said, population growth has increased demand for services at both locations. For the ice garden, uh, it is one of the busiest ice uh, facilities in the state of Minnesota with more than 9,000 hours every year, 24 annual um, tournaments. Uh, that brings a lot of business into Bloomington. Um, it also uh, has a lot of historical uh, relevance in the state of Minnesota. If you weren't familiar, the USA gold medal winning team in 1980 uh, practiced at Bloomington mm -hmm. Ice Garden. Uh, so there's a strong connection to the history of uh, hockey in Minnesota in the United States uh, that happens at big. And uh, it, it is a 50-year-old building, at least for rink one, um, and the whole roof needs to be repaired. Uh, again, we have ADA issues and um, the outdated refrigeration system. So the R22 is the refrigerant that is used and it is no longer being produced because of its environmental impacts. Uh, so there's, a, um, there's an increasing 
uh, well, there's a supply and demand issue for how we get R22. It can't be imported into the country. It can't be manufactured here. And so we have to purchase it on the secondary market. So as, as, the, as the supply gets depleted, the cost just continues to grow up, that, or go up. That's your basic economics lesson for tonight if you were looking for a supply and demand uh, lesson. Uh, and then for residents um, being able to uh, schedule it effectively, uh, means that there's more ice time that's closer to home rather than having to go to other ice facilities around the metro area. Nine Mile Creek Corridor. Uh, this area is uh, very highly valued by the community because of the uh, both passive and active recreation that it provides. And uh, we're looking at new amenities uh, that will help people enjoy that experience. Um, we have uh, Restoration, as I've mentioned a couple times, that has to happen within that creek area, uh, and also prevention of invasive species. We also have several acres of uh, pretty rare remnant prairie, and so prairie management is uh, one of those natural resource management issues that uh, we're working hard to make sure that our prairies are, are preserved and restored. 79% uh, of our residents in last year's community survey identified um, parks, trails, and recreation facilities as being really important to the quality of life here in Bloomington. Uh, for the new Community Health and Wellness Center, uh, this would actually be a, a, a joint um, project that would replace public health and Creekside. So we would locate both our uh, community center and public health activities within the Health and Wellness Center. Uh, what we have uh, put on here is the types of amenities that would be included uh, came about from a study that was actually done in community engagement that was done back in 2018 and 2019. Uh, and at that time, uh, the council did not move forward with the community center project, but the basis for it is still largely the same. And the cost has been updated based on the, the previous iteration uh, an estimated about $101.8 million. Uh, we will go through another round of engagement uh, if the referendum is success or successful uh, and we start moving deeper into planning for the facility. The renovations at Bloomington Ice Garden I've mentioned a couple times. Um, in addition to the refrigerant and the mechanical and the roof replacement, um, Rink 3 is currently an Olympic size. Rink 3 is the most recent addition uh, to Bloomington Ice Garden uh, as a result of the gold medal winning championship team. Uh, have I mentioned that yet? The Olympic gold medal? <laughs> there was this uh, new fascination with Olympic sized sheets. And so all over Minnesota, you saw Olympic sized uh, hockey rinks being built in the 80s. And uh, our rink was one of those. Uh, those have subsequently fallen out of favor because they're not uh, conducive to um, youth hockey. Uh, a big sheet of ice like that is, is frankly uh, hard for uh, young skaters, and it makes it a little bit more difficult for us to program because it's a limited market of users that are interested in playing on an Olympic-sized sheet. So we would be downscaling that to a standard NHL size. Uh, increased dryland training area, uh, increased amenities uh, for the um, rink experience, including uh, the concessions, uh, and then updating locker rooms uh, for everybody to enjoy. And I missed, uh, that's a $37 million investment. Uh, improved access, again, to Nine Mile Creek. So here's some of the work that would be involved. Uh, 12,000 linear feet of stream restoration, 130 acres of woodland and wetland restoration, like I mentioned before, invasive species uh, um, prevention. 12,000 feet of new trails, uh, the last bullet you'll note there, we have seven um, new trail bridges within Central Park, and then above that, uh, a boardwalk that would connect the River Bottom Trails to Moyer and Central Park. Uh, so uh, greatly enhancing the ability for people to access uh, outdoor um, recreation and natural environments. And that's a $20 million project. So I mentioned before that community engagement was a, a significant uh, part of what we did is certainly around the community center project, um, but it has been uh, uh, a way of doing business around here for the last decade or so. The community center conversation actually started back in 2014, I believe, is when that first study was done. Uh, we put together a community center task force back in 2015 uh, that made recommendations. Um, we've uh, 
we've uh, engaged uh, stakeholders in those conversations, done a lot of outreach, and um, have utilized uh, 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 statistically valid random uh, surveys of residents in both 2019 and 2022 to gauge uh, their support and interest for these facilities. Um, and then, like I said, there's the greatest level of engagement possible when everybody will get to vote on November 7th about whether this plan will move forward. Uh, we have created a website uh, called bloomingtonforward.org that provides the information. Uh, so how will the sales tax be utilized if it is indeed approved by voters in November? First of all, the mechanics. Uh, there will be a separate question for each project, and this is required by state statute. Uh, so we will ask the question, uh, do you want a half percent sales tax for a community health and wellness center? Do you want it for the Bloomington Ice Garden? Do you want it for the Nine Mile Creek Corridor? Um, if uh, voters want, they can, they can approve one of them, they can approve some of them, or they can approve all or none. Uh, so in any event, the local sales tax uh, would generate up to $155 million over a 20-year period that could be utilized uh, to service that. Um, and actually, let me clarify that a little bit. The projects are $155 million. The sales tax over 20 years is expected to generate much more than that. What we uh, don't show here is the cost of financing. So debt service over the 20-year period actually means that it's a, it's a bigger number um, based on what the sales tax will generate. So the project uh, funds are $155 million. The Bloomington City Council concluded the sales tax option was the best choice to finance the plan because the cost is then spread among both residents and non-residents. Now, for the state legislature to grant the authority to a local community to ask this question, um, it has to pass their muster on whether this is a, a regional project, a project of regional significance, a regional benefit. And, uh, you know, in, in making that case to the legislature, we demonstrated to them that Bloomington Ice Garden draws people from all over the metro area and all over the state, as a matter of fact. Uh, the same is true for the public health services that we provide. It's not just Bloomington, but we work with Bloomington, or Bloom with Edina and Richfield, uh, and the folks who would be coming into our health and wellness center would be coming from a broader community. And then certainly the Nine Mile Creek Corridor uh, is enjoyed by people from beyond Bloomington who use it uh, as Nine Mile Creek winds its way through a number of different communities. So uh, all of these projects have regional uh, benefit. Uh, and for that reason, it passed that legislative threshold. And the local sales tax would be a half percent um, that would be added. So why the local sales tax? Unlike the property tax, uh, local sales tax spread across residents and non-residents. Okay? So what we're really trying to do is have the folks who appreciate the benefit of these facilities help contribute towards these facilities. 60% of the half percent sales tax is estimated to be paid by non-residents. And I want to talk a little bit about how we get that number. The Department of Revenue annually uh, provides numbers on the amount of sales tax that is generated uh, in each community. The University of Minnesota Extension Service analyzes that data and they break it down and give us a report on how much uh, is estimated to be spent by residents and how much is sales tax generated by non-residents. So the 60% is actually from our most recent report, which was during the pandemic time period. Uh, and that's a time period when much of our hospitality sector, which is significant, was not operating. And so a lot of uh, sales tax from non-residents was not coming in. When we uh, did this report before COVID, that number was between 70 and 75 percent. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I'm not making any promises. I just think that it's likely the number goes back up. Until we have those numbers, however, I have to stick with the most recent one, which is 60. Um, we're actually going to have the number from the University of Minnesota Extension Service hopefully within a month or so. Uh, Department of Revenue should be putting out the last year's figures soon. And then the U of M extension. Oh, they did today? Yep, they did. Oh, I didn't see my emails before this meeting. Okay. So it, it'll take the extension service a couple of weeks to turn those around. So we should have that information shortly. Um, so what does that mean then? That means about a, a $93 million of that $155 uh, would come from non-residents, at least based on that 60% number. 
Um, so the other way to look at this too is the burden on Bloomington taxpayers, utilizing a local option sales tax. The um, average uh, Bloomington household would spend about $85 a year uh, that would be uh, going towards this plan. If we were to do the same projects at the same value uh, and utilize city bonding to do that uh, and ask property taxpayers to pay all of it, uh, you can see the, in, the amount would be quite a bit more, about $230 a year for the median value home. So how does the sales tax work? Um, be applied to the same goods and services as the state sales tax. So uh, you know that uh, food or like groceries and clothing um, baby products, other other products are exempt from sales tax. They would continue to be exempt from sales tax under the local option sales tax. So it doesn't give us access to products that aren't currently taxed. It is only the goods and services that are currently subject to the state sales tax. Uh, you can see what the rate is uh, currently uh, and what it would go up to if it were approved. The uh, uh, the way to calculate it is if you make a $10 purchase, a half percent would be five cents on that $10 uh, would be the impact. Um, and as I mentioned before, revenue from that tax then just pays down the bonds because I mentioned uh, that we'll issue debt for the projects and service that debt with the annual tax revenues over a 20 year period um, or until they're paid off, whichever comes first. That's also a statutory requirement. We can't continue to collect the money once we have satisfied the debt related to the projects. Um, and it can't be extended uh, without authorization from the legislature and a subsequent vote again from the voters of Bloomington. So if one or more questions pass, Bloomington residents approve the sales tax re uh, referendum the city will move forward with design work and financing in 2024 and construction could begin as soon as uh, the latter half of 2024, uh, most likely for the ice garden as the first project um, because that is frankly the one that has the most critical need uh, based on the, the various issues in that facility. It's also the one that is closest to ready from a, a plan design uh, staging. If the three questions don't pass, we will go back out and re-engage with residents. We'll talk to the city council and figure out uh, how we want to re reprioritize our investments and um, look at al alternative ways to get those done. And then you can see some of the consequences uh, in terms of a longer implementation phase and uh, more likely to be um, some smaller projects just due to the cost burden that would be placed on the Bloomington taxpayer. So here's how you can make your voice heard as a um, voter. Uh, as you know, we have early in-person voting, which starts this year on September 22nd, running right up until the day before Election Day, November 6th. Uh, via absentee ballot, uh, you can request those from the Secretary of State's website, or in-person balloting on Election Day, November 7th, at your local polling place. Um, we also have uh, ballot language and precinct information that will be coming soon. And like I mentioned before, uh, you can get uh, information at bloomingtonforward.org or at the Bloomington uh, City website uh, slash vote. So here's the, the website that has been put together for Bloomington Forward. You get details of the project, uh, more detail about the needs that the plan would address. We have a video that's been prepared for each one of the facilities by our communications staff and the staff who work in those facilities to uh, help people understand the, the condition of the facilities and the need that exists, uh, additional cost and tax impact, and some frequently asked questions. So that is the quick run through on the Bloomington Forward Investment Plan. Well, Happy <coughs> to entertain any questions from your respective bodies. Well, that's very interesting, Jamie. I, I just wonder whether the, the mayor and the two other city council people here might want to make any comments before we just have general questions. So. Before I finish this text, is that what you're saying? It's a, yes, okay, exactly. okay, I'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to share that with the whole class. <laughs> Uh, Jamie did a very nice job of prioritizing or, or talking his way through the priorities that we've talked about at a council level. Uh, the the amenities in the city, 
uh, I keep saying uh, to a lot of folks, they were, were wonderful for many, many years and are now past their, their useful lives. And as a community, I think if we wanted to continue to move toward the goal of being a, uh, a community where people want to be, we need to reinvest in our, in our facilities. It's as simple as that. Uh, there are plenty of communities doing this type of thing, and it's attracting young families. It's attracting uh, seniors. It's attracting folks who want to be somewhere where there's community amenities. And I don't want to say this is a keeping up with the Joneses because it's not that. These are amenities for our community, and it's an important part of that. But there, there's an element of uh, if we want to remain competitive as a city, a vibrant, uh, a, a remarkable, enduring community where people want to be, we're going to have to make investments. It's as simple as that. And so it's, uh, I think it's an exciting opportunity. I think it's an exciting way to pay for these great facilities, these great investments. And uh, I think for, a, for nickels on the $10 expenditures, I think it's more than worth it for residents in the city of Bloomington. Councilmember Carter, Councilmember Martin, you want to chime in as well? Um, I don't think I have uh, too much else to add. Um, I will say if you haven't seen the videos that the city has produced that are on the website, uh, they are very compelling. Um, I don't even think I realized how bad the public health building was. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I, I don't even think we're at the point of these are nice to have um, things. These are things that we have to invest in in some way or the other. And so... Um, I don't want to break any rules around I'll what I can say. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I think you did a fantastic job, Jamie, and I wouldn't add anything else. Um, and Mayor, if, if I could, just briefly, I think the conversations I've been having with residents, especially a lot of the hard data we have around um, how these are regional amenities and how that cost burden would be shared with visitors to the community, I think really goes to underscore how Bloomington has evolved over the past generation or so. We are already a hub for economic activity across this entire region, which is why we have all these visitors to be able to share that burden for the cost of projects like these. Uh, and I, I think it's, especially for, for my neighbors and folks I talk to, it's been a great opportunity to open folks' eyes to leaning into serving as a regional hub for, for tying the Twin Cities together and showing in very kind of physical, concrete ways what that produces for our residents. So, um, Mr. President, yes. Madam Chair, if I may, uh, reiterating what the mayor and the council members said about the need, uh, I, th I think the council has been very clear over the last seven, eight years, as a matter of fact, our conversation about amenities and facilities began back in 2015, 2016, when we did strategic planning back then, that there is a critical need for um, reinvestment or replacement uh, for a number of our facilities. And the issue is how do we do it best, right? Or what is, what is the best way to accomplish that? How are we going to fund it? And so, uh, Councilmember Carter said she didn't want to break any rules. Uh, so I want to talk to you real quickly about what those rules are. So according to the state legislature, when we have a ballot referendum, the city cannot advocate for the ballot question. Our role is to educate and to inform. And so uh, it's, there's a pretty clear line when we sit up here um, or we go out in the community or we put out communication pieces about the things we can and cannot say. So all we're doing is presenting the what and the how and some of the why, right? Uh, without putting a value judgment on, you know, saying that uh, we think this is uh, absolutely the super best thing to do. Ultimately, it's the voter's decision. And uh, we provide the information about what the alternatives are. Um, and it's just information, right, based on what we have. Jamie, a couple <laughs> questions just for clarification. Um, so when we say the city can't advocate, I assume that means individuals as well as organizations, right? So me and the Port Authority. Commissioner Keller, uh, the, the rule essentially is this. You can't use city resources to advocate, right? Mm -hmm. So um, how does that affect you as an individual commissioner? Um, if you are using your city of Bloomington email to send out 
emails to other people saying they should vote for this, you would be violating the um, rules. Okay, so you are free as a resident and as an interested community stakeholder to advocate for these projects. You simply cannot use city resources to do it. So no city funds can be expended <coughs> to advocate. And so in your capacity as an appointed commissioner, um, the, the thing that you want to think about is how am I communicating, how I feel about this, and if I'm using city resources to do it, then I better stop doing that. Okay. So to lawyer you a little, since... <laughs> I keep I keep a lawyer with me. <laughs> I have to. Uh, you actually yeah. have two here. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, we are lawyered up. Right. Yeah, I think there's a limit we're supposed to have, aren't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, shaving this a little more closely. So resources, that's actually pretty easy. But I think you're saying then oh, I wouldn't approach a citizen and say, as a port authority commissioner, I recommend you do this. And that seems bad judgment, but putting this I would aside. That you know. Okay. And so the next, I think, easy question is, so somebody walks up to me and says, what do you think? Then you say, well, as a resident, if you say anything, but not speaking on behalf of anything. Um, is that right? Well, uh, Mr. President, Madam Chair, I'll, I'll give my version, and then if the attorneys want to tackle me mid-sentence, they can. Um, <laughs> The fact is that your neighbors, your friends, uh, likely know that you have a role with the city, right? At some point, it is hard to uh, separate yourself because people know that you know things, right? Uh, they, they ask you questions, I'm assuming, about cities going on because they know that you know stuff, right? Uh, you probably aren't going to be in a situation where a complete stranger comes up to you and asks you something that you would have to put that modifier on it, right? And so you already have relationships in the community. People know your involvement with the city. I really don't think that that distinction becomes uh, a necessary consideration other than you know that you're almost always speaking as a resident when you're talking about something like this. You know, Jamie, I think it may be helpful. A lot of us have worked on the school Excess levy referendum, and that's that's very similar to this. I mean, it's the same kind of thing where you you can advocate and, and do it, but the, the school board cannot uh, come out right. formally for it. But elected officials can advocate hmm. as long as they're not using city resources, right? I mean, it's um, you know it's that time of season where we have an election pending, and we have people who are standing for election, and it's not. Uh, unrealistic to think people want to know how they feel about a ballot question, right? As long as those individuals are not using city resources, if they're using their own campaign communications um, and communicating through non-city resources, they can take a position on it as well. So like the school excess levy referendums, is there an independent group that has been ad uh, organized to advocate for this outside uh, of the city? Th my understanding is there is a group that is organizing. I don't know if they've formalized the organization or where they're at, but I, I know there is a group that's interested in working to support the question. Okay. Board of 30 questions, people? HRA, anyone have any questions? I do. Oh, I'm sorry. Commissioner Lutz, I guess, had his hand up. I'm sorry. You can. Um, couple, couple questions. Sorry, and I'm sorry if I missed this. Is the new health and wellness center going on the Creek Center site? Uh, uh, Mr. President, Madam Chair, Commissioners, the direction that the council gave was to uh, uh, site it on the current Creekside site. So it would be destruction of the facility and then building new on top of that site. And how big, do you know off the top of your head, James, how big, it, how much ground is in that site? Uh, off the top of my head, I do not know the acreage. The elements that we included here are based on uh, I believe it is the medium-sized community center alternative that was evaluated back in 2019 um, okay. and back at that stage the council uh, wanted to consider some options and directed us to look at another site and we looked at a larger facility if, if 
my recollection serves the medium-sized facility is the one that best fits for that site. Where would the current services provided in Creekside be conducted then while construction takes place? Mm -hmm. And then when it's all done, what happens to the old public health building when it's blended into the new health and wellness center? Really and then I got question. one more question Mr. after that. Uh, Madam Chair, Mr. President, um, the decisions haven't been made yet about where those uh, Creekside services will be provided in the interim. We have uh, classrooms here in the art center that uh, uh, are vacant much of the time, so we could certainly move some of those services here, and there are other places in the community that we could likely do that. Um, no determination has been made about the future use of the public health building site, um, but that will be part of a larger um, master planning process for the whole campus, the Civic Plaza campus. Could it be sold to the market? It could. And then last question, just a curiosity. I believe you said, I think it was a state agency, came up with the estimate that 60% of the sales tax, if fully approved, would be paid by non-city residents. And I was just wondering, do we have any feel on that? Is that is Bloomington out of the norm on that because we have the Mall of America and other big venues uh, that produce sales tax income? Uh, Mr. President, Madam Chair, the, uh, uh, I, do, I don't know the specific numbers for other communities. I will tell you that our tax generating capacity in Bloomington is greater than most communities. So yes, I would, I, without the evidence and the specifics, just knowing the Bloomington tax base that we produce more than other communities. And, and Jamie, I think you said before that from, from the pre-pandemic period, those numbers were higher. Correct. So they were more like, what, 80%? 75% or so. Something. So 60% was during the pandemic yeah. period. And if I could, Don, Mr. Chair, or Mr. President, and, and Commissioner, I mean, you, you asked about the organization doing this. is the Minnesota Extension Service through the University of Minnesota as they've evolved, you know, away from 4-H and, and, and the, the agricultural ends of things in the Extension Service. They've done, they're, they're deep into community development now, and they do this for communities across the state. If a community wants to do local option sales tax, they'll do this analysis for them. Are you saying they've been urbanized? <laughs> <laughs> they provide yes. a spectrum of services. Yes, they do. Uh, and our, yeah. our, our CFO has reminded me that the reports from the University of Minnesota Extension Service are available online on the Bloomington Forward site. <clears throat> so you can actually dig into those reports and get more detail on how they did their analysis. We've been monopolizing the questions. All right, Commissioner yeah. Wooten, you had a question? I had a couple, actually. Good. So one of the questions I had was the $4.7 million that was appropriated through the legislature, two point seven was going to, um, is it the design or is it? Pre-planning. Pre-planning for the ice rink and only a um, little over a million is going for the? 2.27 to um, big and $1.8 million to public health. Okay. And the variance in those are for the purpose of, I, I know the ice rink is a freestanding facility that's going to be, you know, primarily rehab, but the wellness center is actually build up, tear down, but it's getting less money for planning. It's a great question, Commissioner Wooden, and I don't know the answer because that's the vagaries of what happens behind the curtain of the legislature. <laughs> so actually, um, we had put in requests um, and our, our local legislators authored legislation for um, capital bonding for both the ice garden and the public health building. Uh, I'm trying to remember the exact numbers. We're about 15 million for the ice garden, and I want to right, and about 10 million for the public health building. Because when when uh, the state does bonding for a project, mm -hmm. it tends to be a 50-50 match, right? So what we asked for was 50% of the project cost. Instead of funding the full request, uh, and this wasn't exclusive to Bloomington because they had so many requests for bonding this year, is they gave a little bit to an awful lot of communities, and it's for that specific pre-planning activity, understanding those communities are probably going to come back in the future and ask for additional funds. So can I, I'm not sure I get a chance to interject here, but I'm going to interject. Um, so the planning for the Wellness Center is significant to me is a resident, in part because of our growth as a community and the disparities in regards to services for seniors, individuals who are maturing versus the young families we are trying to attract. So in saying that, in looking at the Wellness Center in relationship to programming as well as structure, are there going to be some considerations given to 
that being not only a facility for you know, services being rendered, but also for therapeutic opportunities that might encompass individuals who are maturing in age. Yep. Uh, Madam Chair, Mr. President, Commissioner Wooten, uh, I have to refresh myself on the various elements of the project here um, and uh, how much of the therapeutic element plays in. My recollection, and council members can help me out with this, when we were talking about the aquatic features mm -hmm. that are included within the Health and Wellness Center, the therapeutic um, was part of that conversation. And I don't know ultimately where we landed on that. I think it largely depends on the size of the facility and what we're able to accommodate. Mm -hmm. But the reason that we have redescribed this as a community health and wellness center, as opposed to previously just being a community center, is that um, by incorporating public health into uh, the community center concept is we really want to use this as a place where we can drive better health outcomes right. for all people within the community, right. right? And so figuring out what services we can provide that are going to generate those outcomes is an important part of the planning process. Okay. And then I have one other question if I can ask. That's okay. So the communication um, that's gone out, I know we can't advocate as board members and, and commissioners, and I know there's a group, and well, you stated there's a group out there that's actually kind of gearing itself up to be advocates for the actual tax increase. Are we making ourselves aware of those groups who are uh, gearing up to also talk against the amendment? Because I actually have had a chance to view a couple of those um, mediums online, and, and they don't speak very highly of our choices. Uh, commissioners, I... I do not know of a group that has been formally organized as uh, uh, um, organizing to uh, defeat the question. Um, I've seen similar comments online, so I don't know if there's a there's an organized effort. Yep. Okay. Uh, yes. Hi, my question is about Creekside and the Community Health Wellness Center. Is there going to be a cost to that? I mean, is there membership? that you're going to have to pay into monthly or yearly or to support that? Uh, Madam Chair, Mr. President, Commissioner, um, is it Mueller or Mueller? Mueller, Mueller. like Bueller. Got it. Yeah. Good. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we, uh, we anticipated back in 2019 that there would be a uh, membership subscription model, but we didn't have the fine details of what that would be. Um, that'll be part of the work that we have to do as our next stage planning uh, once we know that the project is moving forward uh, to figure out how do you how do you put together the operating um, p l to make it work yeah. so follow up question is the i don't know maybe an estimate of pricing going to be available before the election because I mean, I'm, I'm afraid this is going to be cost prohibitive for families. Uh, I think the answer is probably no, that we don't have that level of detail and we won't by November. Yeah. So we're supposed to vote for something that we don't know if we can use financially. It's a good question. <clears throat> okay. Yes. Uh, if I may. Um, so I do think, if I recall, when we talked about it years ago now at this point, it sounds like and please correct me if I'm wrong, most cities that have community centers with amenities do have some kind of membership fee. Um, but I think uh, when we talked about it years ago again, there were conversations of possible sliding scale fees. Right. Um, but then the other piece of this is that it is going to be a public health facility, and public health services, many are free to the community. Um, and going back to your question about seniors, I mean, the public health department has a lot of services that are provided to not only, you know, new mothers and babies, but also seniors. And so, I mean, I would love for us to talk more about how it will be a multi-generational space, um, because I do think we get this question around uh, amenities uh, that are currently at Creekside and how they're gonna continue to be available to people. But then I also, I mean, I think the point you bring up around the cost is a really good one. Um, I mean, but I think that there are going to be pieces that will be available to the community, and then there will probably be pieces that have a cost. Hopefully I didn't say anything inaccurate. You did not. <laughs> <laughs> are there any other questions? Are there Port Authority questions? Jamie, could I have, offer one clarification? Sure. Um, 
chairs and members, uh, acting chair and members. Um, I'm Melissa Manderscheid, the city attorney, and I've been working to pull together the information related to ballot advocacy, um, both for staff and for um, our elected and uh, appointed officials. So there is, uh, there have been some attorney general opinions and state auditor opi opinions related to advocacy specific to elected officials and public officials um, along the lines of the folks seated here. And there is one, uh, Jamie's points are all accurate um, with regard to a prohibition on using city resources. The one additional element I'll add because I know you all get requests to speak at, at um, events is that there is um, uh, a recognized exception. Um, you all can orally, which means words coming out of your mouth, orally advocate as public officials and elected officials um, at a speaking engagement. So you can orally advocate. Um, there has been, I, I believe it was since 1966, um, an attorney general opinion on that point. So if you're ever having a question, you're always welcome to contact myself or Julie Eddington, um, your other attorney who's here, um, and talk through a specific situation if you have a question. But you you should not and cannot uh, use your city resources, uh, your email address, your um, uh, uh, like st use staff to prepare presentations for your speaking engagements, um, that sort of thing. So just be mindful of that. If you ever have any questions, always reach out. Jamie, I had a, just a comment that I, I was looking for anything that would talk about cost savings and coming from the supermarket industry. Uh, I know how expensive refrigeration is, and my guess is, is that, at, especially at the ice gardens and things, that replacing this equipment would probably be, uh, generate some significant ongoing cost savings. And, and I know this whole issue that you're talking about refrigerants is just a horrendous issue for the, the whole supermarket industry. And, and it's gotten to be very, very expensive. And sometimes you just can't even find it. So um, those are, I think, points that uh, could be added. So other comments, questions? So, Rob? This is just to follow up my question on the land area. Because I was in the interim, I was checking things out. The, the Creekside Center itself has got 4.75 acres. There's another 3.6 acres in Creekside Park. Is the park going to be part? Is the park going to disappear and be part of the Health and Wellness Center? Uh, Madam Chair, Mr. President, Commissioners, Commissioner Lunds, um, that will be a decision for the City Council to make as we go through the planning process. Uh, and what's going to best complement or um, help facilitate successful development of the project. I mean, one of the, frankly, one of the issues when you're dealing with a, a, a site constraint on size is they have to account for parking uh, mm -hmm. requirements. And, um, you know, one of the things we'll have to look at is whether structured parking is going to be part of the plan because obviously structured parking adds... Uh, additional cost to the project. So trying to balance out project cost and other other building requirements is part of the process. Yeah. If combined in the whole, the two pieces together have an L shape, yeah. which is a little more tricky to deal with. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other? Well, thank you very much, Mr. City Manager. Thank you all, appreciate it. As uh, the city attorney said, we're always happy to answer questions. So. Uh, either work through your um, your uh, liaison, your staff liaison, or feel free to contact me directly. Thanks, everybody. And the next item we have is the annual housing report. So just looking through this, it was really interesting. So I'm anxious to hear more about it. <clears throat> Hello. Welcome. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, 
Mr. President, Madam Chair, Commissioners, thank you so much for having me um, to present the annual housing report for the calendar year 2022 to all of you. Um, I appreciate the HRA commissioners uh, bearing with me and hearing my presentation in iteration. I, I appreciate your attention and I hope maybe you learn something new. And I see your name is Michelle. Why don't you just- Oh, yes. My name is Michelle Lincoln. I am a long range planner uh, and a planner for the HRA. I started in January. Um, so I'm fairly new to the project or to the city um, and new to the project. And I was really excited to get started. I really am invested in housing and accessibility to housing uh, and sharing my findings. Well, I can already tell that you're excited about this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so the annual housing report, there is, this is the third year that it's been completed, um, and this is an opportunity to share these findings with the port for the first time, um, and hopefully opening up kind of curiosity and energy and continuing to share this broadly with the city um, as this data coalesces in all things housing. Uh, the, re the report in its entirety is now available on the website, All Things Housing 2022, uh, so you can read um, much more detail about our findings and the city's work in that report right now. In my presentation, I will be reviewing demographics, existing housing and affordability, what we did in 2022, and what we're going to be doing in the rest of 2023 and into 2024. So here we have our demographics, um, our population right now, uh, from the uh, estimates from the Met Council, um, what happens is the city can put forth a petition in order for the Met Council to review estimates using their specific methodology in order to determine what our population estimates are. Um, that number is now 91,330 people. This is really important, this impacts our per capita state and funding and aid. Um, so having accurate estimates or more refined estimates for our population um, can mean that we are tapping into uh, the state aid and funding, uh, per capita funding that is uh, helps our community. Um, so this was an excellent result from our petition to the Met Council. Um, our housing, our household numbers were also updated um, and in order to kind of better match the increase. Uh, it was an increase of 892 people and 465 housing units for the year 2022. Uh, forecasts for 2030 and 2040 have not been calculated, but now knowing that we have these estimates and the and how the Met Council builds off of these, um, and they're going into their next cycle of forecasting, we should see some updates um, in that cycle to our forecasts for the next decades. So our average household size is 2.23 people. Um, this is uh, smaller than the region. The region is 2.5, of uh, 2.53 persons per household, um, and also smaller than the state. The state is 2.49 persons per household. Um, our households per children is 25, or house, households with children. Uh, children is defined as those who are uh, under eight, under the age of 18. Um, is 25.3%. Uh, this is also smaller than the region and the state. The region has 31.3% of households with children. Um, this can kind of be accounted for um, our uh, resident or residents of over the age of 16, uh, over 65 at 19.5%, um, and our median age of 42.2. We're a little bit, we're skewing a little bit older than the region. Uh, this can be for a lot of reasons. Um, one of the things that you can say is like a lot of people want to stay in their communities for their entire life. So as their lifestyles change, they are finding ways in order to stay within Bloomington's boundaries because this is their home. Um, and uh, that just accounts for these numbers. And there's a lot of other factors that can go into it, um, but it's not always alarming. Just means people want to be here. For our race and ethnicity, um, we have 32% uh, of the population um, is uh, black, indigenous, and people of color. Uh, this is up from 2010 when it was 20%. So in 
So we're seeing we are growing in our BIPOC population. Um, and we are also um, more diverse than the region. 26% uh, of the, pi of the pi population is BIPOC in the metropolitan region. And we are more diverse than the state. The state is 19.3% BIPOC. Um, so there is definitely a lot of opportunity to um, really evaluate the community and what they need. And then we can work towards that and understanding that there may be diverse needs across age groups, race and, race and ethnicity, um, and other kind of needs and amenities as families, multi-generational families um, uh, stay in Bloomington or come to Bloomington. For our existing housing, as you can see here, 50% of all of our housing units are single unit detached homes. Um, and then the remainder are multifamily or larger than um, single family detached homes. Miscellaneous residential, just as a note, um, includes things like vacant residential land um, and things where there may be a garage on a residential land, but not actual house yet or legally non-conforming. Um, and multifamily is greater than three units. These are our single family rental licenses. Um, as you can see, there was an uptick in licensing uh, for new licenses um, located at the bottom from 157 uh, in 2021 to 184. This is actually in part due to a spring 2022 city code amendment uh, where environmental health amended their code in, to license all group homes as rentals and also DHS licensed group homes are also included in that number. Um, so you, we just saw a, an uptick in new licenses and then we've, as you can see, we've kind of remained fairly steady in the last few years. In ownership and renting, I've highlighted what our overall um, owner renter ratio is. We have 67% owner occupied units in the city. We have 33% renting. I break it down by race and ethnicity. Um, and as you can see, we, there are great disparities as you look at each of those categories where the lowest home ownership is of black or African American residents. They are only um, owning homes currently at the rate of 27.1%. Um, in looking at the United States, Minnesota, and Bloomington, um, there's some work to, to be done there in order to assist people who want to own homes uh, who are black or African American, enabling them to own homes. Um, yeah. <laughs> For our income and employment, um, I just want to highlight the, um, the 2022 regional area mini, uh, median incomes. Um, these are derived from HUD numbers, um, and then they are calculated for um, the Twin Cities metro region. 100% um, AMI, which means that you um, are, that's kind of like comfortable number, but 100% of the of the area median income is $118,200. Um, anything that's below, 80% like and below, um, is considered an area where subsidization may come in for funding and other assistance. Um, particularly the 60% AMI is very important. So $70,380. That is many of, uh, represents many of the thresholds for, ben or benchmarks for analysis or assistant programs and with um, also the 30% AMI um, is 35,200 and that's really you know a really an important group to pay attention to um, because um, subsidization could really help them with their livelihood um, and generating stability and uh, wealth. So uh, for the uh, region the county and Bloomington, 
we have all been growing over the last 13 years um, here, and it uh, 11, shows 11 years of that. Um, we have been slightly lower than the county and the region, um, kind of because once you add more variables, you can have numbers pool in either direction, but we've all been growing together. Um, and right now, our median area uh, income for the for Bloomington is eighty thousand five hundred eighty two dollars, um, which is below the eighty percent AMI for the region, um, which can really indicate that we might want to perk up and pay attention because there may be affordability issues that we can assist with. Some really good news is that um, from the unemployment spike in twenty twenty. Uh, where it was at 7.6%, we have come down to 2.7%. So more people who are eligible for the workforce are working, um, especially in recovering from the pandemic, which had sig significant disruption in all of our lives in a variety of different ways. And we're seeing some in these metrics, some of those things recovering. For housing cost burden, Overall, uh, owners are 20.5% uh, of owners are housing cost burden. Housing cost burden means that 30% um, of their 30% or more of their income goes towards housing costs. And there's also severely housing cost burden, which is 50% more or more um, of your income goes to housing cost. Um, these numbers account for the 30% or greater number. Um, so 45.9% of renters are housing cost burden in the city. And breaking down housing cost burden by income, you'll notice that those who are making $35,000 or less are severely, in, um, are more likely to be housing cost burdened um, at, at significant rates. We see drops from 35,000 to 50,000 and from 50,000 to 75,000. But these numbers show that if you are going to avoid housing cost burden, you must make $75,000 or more. If you make less than $75,000, your risks of being housing cost burden are very high. Um, we're gonna talk about ownership and affordability. So these are the, um, affordable home prices that are based on the incomes provided by HUD, um, which I had reviewed previously and also list here. So from that, they make some assumptions on mortgages. Those, thing, those assumptions have been updated for this year, but at the time of 2022, those assumptions were that it was a fixed interest 30-year home loan. The interest rate was 3% which feels like such long a time ago. <laughs> There's a 28% debt to family income ratio. Um, you have a 3.5% down payment, um, so FHA loans or higher um, for traditional financing. You have a property tax rate of 1% of the property sales price. Your mortgage insurance is 0.85% of unpaid principal, and you have $100 per month for hazard insurance. So all of those, the foundation created by those assumptions are then derived uh, and incomes are then derived for what would be a affordable home price for these income levels. So noticing here the affordable home price for 80% AMI is $355,600 and our median home value for a single family residential home is $355,900. This means that at least 50% of the housing in Bloomington is unaffordable if you make $89,400 a year. Also in looking at median sales price for other types of homes, single family, condominiums, townhouses, two family homes, zero lot lines, which could be things like, you know, uh, you have a duplex that's side by side and it's split. Um, you can see that there's also significant unaffordability there and that no housing is affordable for those who make 30% AMI. 
And then in addition to that, you see difficulty, you see less access to the housing in the city um, because this shows that at least 50% of housing is unaffordable to 60% and 50% AMI. You may see some affordability in condominiums, um, but this is based on a family of four, so you'd have to find a condominium that accommodates a family of four, which you may see higher costs for those things. For renting and affordability, you can see here um, the changes from 2021 average rent and 2022 average rent. Um, the total average saw about a 7.1% increase. Um, and then we saw increases in um, all housing uh, unit types. So studio, one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom, except for a little bit in the two bedroom, um, it went down $2. So, and uh, your one bedroom also went down $45. Um, this is based on CoStar data, um, which is data that is collected, um, that is self-reported. Um, typically, we have about a little over 13,000 um, units with, da uh, with data and self-reported. It can kind of fluctuate between what's reported, and this is based on asking rent. So there's a lot of things about this that we may not be able to predict, like if there was any kind of bonuses or if the rent was increased after, for different reasons. Um, this is just what the asking rent is based on. Naturally occurring affordable housing is considered housing that meets the 60% AMI for affordability um, without government subsidy. So they haven't secured funding in order to offer units, specifically income restricted, um, and they haven't um, very specifically advertised as um, affordable at certain incomes levels. But because of building condition or age or the type of unit, um, the asking rent ends up being affordable for 60% um, AMI or less. Um, it is not guaranteed that people who need that type of housing are in these units, um, but they are on the market, which is something to kind of consider. Of our total, of the total data, we had about 9,400 units that um, reported rent, um, and the total NOAA units was about 60% of those, of that reported data. As you can see, um, that affordability can be a little bit different if you stratify by housing unit type. So studios, one bedrooms, and two bedrooms, you might see a majority of those units have, of those NOAA properties and units, uh, have options at those prices. Uh, but once you get into kind of three bedroom or even four bedroom, the availability of those units at these prices just dramatically goes down. And that could also be for a variety of, of reasons where maybe places just aren't making three bedroom and four bedroom, so there's a very restricted supply, um, and that could just impact affordability as well. For new development in 2022, we uh, added uh, a bit over 1,500 units uh, of housing to Bloomington. And I, uh, in the colors here, I show a breakdown by AMI um, of which units fall into those categories for a total of 351 below market rate affordable housing, uh, which accounts to about 23% of the housing units that we added. As you can see, 60% AMI had significant additions, um, but we're seeing Really low numbers for 30% AMI, which is historically and traditionally a very hard um, income uh, bracket in order to secure housing for, um, but we're working on it. It is definitely a priority um, for the city in order to really make sure that those very housing cost burdened income brackets have housing for, to so they can live here, so they can contribute and be in our community um, and know that your, your neighbors are thriving. 
So for our total affordable units uh, t since 2020 and our 2030 goals, I want to describe that the 2030 goals come from uh, Met Council. Um, they have a, they went through uh, like a livability and housing uh, process um, and they kind of look at the whole region and they look at population and a variety of other variables and kind of determined how many new units of housing um, should communities aim for in order to meet population growth or different demands. Uh, and they also break it down by affordability. So based on this here, you can see that we have um, surpassed our, our 2030 goals for 60% AMI. We're getting really close on 50% AMI, and we really have a lot of work to do in the next several years for that 30% AMI. Um, but we are adding new housing, and that's really good for the community overall, and we should feel accomplished for that because it's not always easy to succeed in housing creation. And now we can really um, continue uh, to, to grow our housing creation and focus on that 30% AMI. There we go. I uh, just wanted to show you a map for the residential that was completed in 2022. Um, you can see these three green dots here have affordable components and where they're located. Um, and then we have um, the senior apartments over in the west of, side of Bloomington that have fully market rate. So out of this, we had uh, completed uh, residential. We had 467 units with 193 affordable. There's projects in the pipeline and this is also realizing that we are six months into 2023, so these may be a lot farther along than at the end of 2022, which is awesome. We're still growing there. Um, but at the time, at the end of the calendar year, um, these were the projects that were in the pipeline. You can see a cluster over in South Loop, um, as well as around uh, 30, uh, I-35. And of the, <clears throat> of the total units, 180 nine are affordable of the 1,060 units that were in the pi pipeline at the end of 2022. So for a uh, community development update, just kind of showing all the ways that the community development divisions have contributed um, and supported housing in the year. So for planning, we had code amendments and housing studies and major development reviews. This includes things like the Transitional Industrial Zoning District, which now allows housing as a conditional use, so opens up opportunities for that housing creation. Um, we also are look, looked at our multifamily parking requirements ordinance in order to make sure that we are um, responding to the needs of the residents um, as well as the surrounding areas, but also maximizing the buildable area for our housing. Also, we had a U, uh, an ADU standards update um, in order to allow opportunities for people to add ADUs to their properties in some ways or uh, shape or form, um, which can help if you have multi-generational housing or um, you're looking to rent. There's a lot of opportunities that you can do with an ADU, so those were updated. And then we also uh, were involved in major development review to make sure that um, these standards are being followed, um, encouraging uh, and affordable units in these new developments. For buildings and inspections, they have continued to be involved in permitting um, as part of their involvement and facilitation of permitting and management of the permitting at the city. Um, they observed that Bloomington residents invested almost $22 million in valuation through remodels and renova renovations of existing single family homes in 2022. This is amazing. Updating the quality of our housing is really important. Um, and uh, seeing our residents take initiative to do these things um, really shows an investment in where they live and their homes. Um, and it also strengthens our housing stock in the long term. This is also um, in tandem with things like HRA's Home Improvement Loan Program, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, so there's a lot of cross collaboration um, in the division. Also the time of sale program, which um, notifies uh, sell or excuse me, buyers on properties of um, the history and various 
things that go into property history for a governance um, to these sellers and so they know about all the variety variety of things that have happened with the property. Um, this project is, uh, excuse me, program is 25 years running and it is now moved completely in house to be managed by the uh, building and inspections program, which is uh, amazing. For the HRA, we've had uh, great gains and uh, successes in our housing choice vouchers program. We assisted 109 new households in VASH, uh, FYI, emergency and portability housing, which is amazing. And also assisted 537 households with tenant-based vouchers, really helping people um, be in the communities that they wanna live. Also, we have rental homes for future home buyers. Four households purchased homes with two more that may purchase at a later date. An assistant rent, assisted rental, two households successfully exited the program and two households purchased homes. For the Home Improvement Loan Program, 24 loans were approved last year, um, totaling over $600,000. 46 loans were satisfied and those repayments were almost a million dollars. Five help loans were approved at $27,860 issued. And additionally, the down payment assistance program was began development, which is a really important program that can help people who may lack um, just initial capital investment, own homes. For the Port Authority, I'm sure you're all excited to hear all the amazing things that the Port Authority have done. <coughs> As a result of the uh, HRA assessment last year, the Port Authority will now manage and facilitate development citywide. Um, this includes multifamily properties, 20 units or more, which aligns with the Opportunity Housing Ordinance. Um, and the Port Authority will, manage, will now manage the Opportunity Housing Ordinance and work with the appropriate boards and commissions when projects uh, arise and to pursue the various funding sources related to the OHO and our other housing goals. Additionally, uh, the uh, creative placemaking, which is uh, in a, a under or the Port Authority, um, they have continued to invest in the community in a variety of ways, uh, like the Blooming Ribbon uh, program, which had arts installations at BCS, um, and continued to improve the landscape through visual um, elements like art. Um, also, there's Hometown Poetry, which showcased the community's creativity, and also the Colors of Community pop-up event at Old Shock and Old Cedar. Um, this was uh, an amazing opportunity to activate the space, highlight local businesses, kick off the facade quick build improvements program, um, and just for all families of all types to have a lot of fun. Environmental health made code amendments and procedure updates. So their code amendments were to reduce disparities in discrimination in rental housing. They removed definitions of family and switched to following the uh, 2021 International Property Maintenance Code and Occ Occupancy Standards. Also updated group home and housing licensing requirements as I mentioned previously. And they also updated rental procedures and fees to make sure that those fees match um, uh, the hours input into those programs. It also repealed, uh, the division repealed the crime-free requirements in order to eliminate barriers to housing for people who may have experienced violence in the past. For assessing, they've tracked long-term market trends. Uh, they look at um, things like the assessed value and sales prices, but also um, are guided by state statute. And part of that is on a five-year cycle, they must review 100% of the properties in the city. Um, over that five-year period, they aim to accomplish 20% every year um, in order to meet that goal, um, and they were right on top of it and got 20% reviewed uh, in 2022. 
And now we're ready for the rest of 2023 and going into 2024. So what's next? Um, so HRA is updating soft software in order to better serve clients and into better record keeping and more nimble in having access to this information. Um, so everyone is working a little bit more efficiently. Um, also, there's working on pathways to homeownership, housing stability, creation, and preservation. Um, and I think this multi-pronged kind of vision <coughs> really helps maximize the affordability and getting people in the housing that they can afford. Um, this has already happened now, but the single and two-family standards were adopted from planning, which is great. Yay, we did it. Um, and then uh, in order to kind of also um, support housing creation. Also, um, there's a study on missing middle housing standards. Uh, uh, single room occupancy standards are moving to 2024. Short-term uh, short rental regulations. The Port Authority is growing, which is really exciting. Um, so they have more capacity in order to work on the new things that they've taken on uh, post-assessment. And then creative placemaking is supporting the Small Business Center. Um, Latino Conservation Week Festival is coming up July 22nd. This is a great opportunity for them to highlight natural, res natural assets, which really draw people to Bloomington and also draw people to want to live here. And then in August, we have our Indigenous History in Bloomington event. Um, so definitely in, in those in these coming couple of months, uh, look into those and kind of join these really cool events that Creative Placemaking is developing and implementing. Thank you. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Well, thank you first, Michelle. And I'll let Cheryl say the same thing. But. Yes, thank you. Good report. But, I mean, I, I was really impressed reading this before just with, with all the depth of data and it, it it shows that there's a lot of work to do. I was I pulled out a couple of slides here in this. You were talking about income and employment, and it was just really reinforcing the, the question that one of the HRA commissioners made about the new if we do Creekside Update Center, how do people afford it? Because our our <coughs> median income is less, and so that just really underscores tailoring something for Bloomington that that is meets the needs of our many of our residents and and uh, we of course know that median income is is median income there's a lot of people substantially below that so that was a, a, a really interesting uh, thing but uh, I, I think just looking forward it's it's really a, a big jump for the Port Authority and, and the HRA knows so much more about these things it's something that we've we have looked at obviously with the development of the south loop and a lot of the new housing has gone out there but uh it's it's really getting up to speed on how we do it and when you said that the port authority now is responsible for housing units of 20 or more mm -hmm. <laughs> then uh, and also if you're going to build the the 30 percent AMI housing, it really has to be done in units of 20 or more unless the subsidy that you're putting in is, you know, really horrendous. So it's, it's uh, the, the challenge that, that you lay out here is really dramatic. Just how do we provide the funding longer term to do these things? What are the sources? And then, of course, we also know that, that the NOAA housing, the natural occurring, is under siege in many places. And there's been several projects in Bloomington that have been rescued in quotes uh, from being turned over so it's it's going to be a, a real challenge so well, i'll shut up and see if commissioner keller well um a few things <clears throat> number one i have always been uh grateful for and impressed by the professionalism uh and work of port authority staff and i'm absolutely certain all the port authority commissioners agree with that so one of the things i've enjoyed uh about this meeting in getting to know HRA is seeing the same thing there. Um, been very impressed. Um, it's a very powerful presentation, uh, and, I, and appreciate that very much. I think there are some links between your presentation and a couple of the other things we said. I mean, first off, to to your point earlier about affordability in 
you know, accessing specific services. And one looks at this presentation and wonders if why that'd be a problem if no one could afford to live here. I mean, we have to do something about that. And I um, would tie that back to the earlier discussion that Jamie had had with us about advocacy and uh, how when we get to an election, one one needs to be careful about what one does when you're part of uh, an organ of city government. But um, if we're going to be advocating for changes to address these type of things, we need to be conscious of the fact that that is in part a budgetary matter or in large part a budgetary matter. And um, when I think of explaining uh, a, a tax increase for ice sheets, which are great but less important to me, uh, I, I think we need to remember it's important to get ahead of people's perceptions. I, I read an article today. I have, don't have the slightest recollection what it was about, but part of it was about the rich. And the author was defining rich as anything over $90,000 a year. And I don't know how Jeff Bezos feels about that, but that's a ridiculous number. I thought then, and now I've got ammunition to show it. I mean, I just blown away. So I, I'm just, I guess I'm advocating that we all be conscious of this and try to use it to educate the community before we go to them and ask the money so that the ground's been prepared a little bit. And then finally, I have to say, I love the graphics in this presentation. As someone who does presentations, I'm stealing ideas all over the place. It is really <laughs> communicative. And in particular, page 29, where we've got the um, ownership and renting slide here if you could draw, almost draw a perfectly straight line from top to bottom uh, on a 45 degree angle and it really communicates powerfully however being the lawyer and actually being colorblind and I know Lori's heard this from before the only slide I've had a problem as a colorblind person is, is this one and it just helps me and perhaps other people in the world there there are more than one of us if there are differentiations in shade as well as color. I never have a problem anywhere else. And I could see the difference if I look at both ends, but there's this sort of blend in the middle. I just, it's obviously, it's a nitpick compared in particular to the choices made through here and how it much more powerful the, the presentation is because of that. So thank you, great job. Um, thank HRA for what they're doing, um, great stuff. Yeah, Mr. President, Madam Chair, Commissioner Keller, thank you. That's really, accessibility is very important to me. Um, so it's really important that these comments come up so that way I can make adjustments. I take a lot of pride in my presentations um, and I want to continue to improve. So I really appreciate you bringing that up. Thank you. Um, HRA commissioners, does anyone have any questions? Yes, Commissioner Wooten. I don't necessarily have a question. I guess it's a, uh, I guess a point of interest for the Port Authority, primarily looking at addressing the 3% area. Might there be some discussion around policy that involves looking at uh, alternative use for some of these commercial properties we have which are primarily vacant, mm -hmm. or at least um, overtly vacant. They could be used for housing and addressing that issue. Um, does anyone else, any other commissioners have any comments? Great, thank you. We haven't heard whether our two leaders of our two groups, Erica and Holly, have any comments or things that they want to make. Thank you. Did I pronounce your name right that time? It's Erica. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, President, um, Mr. President, Madam Chair, Commissioners. I just want to add, um, I did hear uh, the comment around the HRA and the port and the port focusing on 20 units or more citywide and how are we going to do that with the 30% units that are needed? We're the Wonder Twins. We work together. <laughs> You're not at this alone. So it would be a combination of the HRA and Port Authority staff that do work together to realize this and then the, the leadership and decision making um, by these respective boards and bodies. And I would like to emphasize how excited I am to see these groups sitting together. Eric and I sit across from each other in the office, and we and our teams talk with each other all day long. And so I hope that this is a really good first step 
towards the HRA and the Port Authority working together to fulfill some of these goals for the city. Mr. President, Madam Chair, Commissioners, I really appreciate your attention. If you have any more questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. In addition to, like, please, if you want to see more fun uh, graphics, please look at the report. <laughs> well, and Michelle, you're just as excited at the end of the report after having to, as Commissioner Keller said, go through all these statistics. I'm excited that's too. A, that's a real, that's a real tribute. Uh, Thank you. So I, I guess is that the final thing on our agendas, I think. So thank you very much. That was great. We, I think we should give her a hand. Yep. She did a nice job. Um, so I, I think, Madam Chair, do you have other items on your we agenda? We have just one other item, which is generally our last item opened up to the commissioners for any questions or comments. Hearing none, that was our last item. So okay. we'd be ready for adjournment. Okay. Port Authority, any when you want to make any final comments? If not, I will adjourn the Port Authority meeting. And um, I will call our meeting, uh, adjourn our meeting as well.